All right. So praise God. I hope to be there tomorrow and hope to see many of you there tomorrow too. Amen? Amen. It's good to get up early in the morning. Right? You see the dew on the ground and the birds singing. and It's beautiful. Right? And especially with some brethren. Amen? Yeah. Amen. It's beautiful. And I remember those days. It's awesome. Anyway, again, so we're, we're going to go into this message. And, you know, it's funny because I wrote a couple of notes here. But earlier on this morning, um, for those of you that were tuning in, Vernon was speaking about being almost home. Remember that this morning? Being almost home. And to be almost home means we must be ready to go there. Don't you think so? And then... As Elder Kim was doing Sabbath school, we saw that the children of Israel were sighing and crying. And we saw that was one of the last things we read in Exodus chapter 2 and verse 23, right? They were sighing and crying because they also were longing to go home. Think about that. Do you understand what I mean? To be home is to be free. Amen. Is that right? Amen. They were longing to be free, but they needed to get to a place where they sighed and cried. And it's interesting because nobody knew what the message was going to be today, but it all fell into place because the message is actually entitled The Loud Cry. Amen? Amen. And our scripture reading is taken from Revelation 18, verses 1 and 2. And we're going to pray in a minute, but we're going to go to the scripture reading. Revelation 18, verses 1 and 2. When you there, just say amen. I hear some pages still ruffling. You going to it back there? Revelation 18, verses 1 and 2. Let me know when you got it. Amen. Amen. We got somebody up here has it. Amen. Some people back there got it. Okay. Revelation 18, verse 2 says this. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power. And the earth was lightened with his glory. And notice what he did next. He cried mightily with a strong voice. We're going to stop right there. Today we're going to look at the dynamics of the loud cry. Is that okay? Because this is a prophetic movement of God's people that will soon swell and become magnified throughout the entire earth. So without Further ado, without any more further introduction, we're going to go right into it. But before we do that, we're going to pray. So I'm going to ask you to just bow your heads with me as we, as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you of how you have been orchestrating things today, even in preparation for this message that you have for us at this moment. And so, dear Father, as we prepare our hearts to receive a word from your throne, I pray, Lord, that you would empty me of self and anything that would hinder you to speak through me and to me. And so, dear Father, I pray the same for all of those within the hearing of my voice, that we would all surrender our hearts right now. Don't look at me, but listen to you. And listen to the words that come from you, because I am nobody and less than nothing. Glorify yourself, Lord, and ignite a fire within each and every one of us. For now, this according to your will, in the name of Jesus. With thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. So first we're going to take a look at what the loud cry is not. And I'm going to read from some different quotations, some Bible commentaries and different things like that, which are all applicable and relative to the Word of God. This first comment that I'm going to be reading to you is from this the Bible Commentary, Volume 4, page 1184. It says, God has jewels in all the churches. How many churches? All. all. God has jewels in all the churches. This, this is a principle, this is a, a point we want to understand. That God has jewels in all the churches and it is not for us to make sweeping denunciations of the professed religious world. Amen. You get that? Amen. Because a lot of people are actually doing this. They're making sweeping denunciations of the professed religious world, and that is not the loud cry. 
The loud cry does not contain any sweeping denunciations against people within any particular denomination. And as I just mentioned, there are preachers out there that are doing this very thing. But this is not the loud cry. In many cases, the very people being denounced are in a more righteous condition than the ones doing the denouncing. You know, whenever you want to know how to witness all, we don't have to go that far, you know. All you have to do is study how Christ did it. Christ is our example on how to witness to people. We can never make a judgment against any individual simply on the premise that they are a member or members of a particular denomination which may not have the light that you or I may have. Amen. Amen. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, page 70 and 71 says this The Lord has his representatives in all the churches. How many? All, all churches have God's representatives in it? The Lord has his representatives in all the churches. These persons have not had the special testing truths of these last days presented to them under circumstances that brought conviction to heart and mind. Therefore, they have not, by rejecting light, severed their connection with God. I'm going to say that one more time. These persons, these people that God has in all of these churches, in every denomination, have not had the special testing truths for these last days presented to them under circumstances that brought conviction to heart and mind. In other words, you can't say that these people have rejected Christ because they're following whatever light they have been given. Unfortunately, God doesn't have as many workers as he would like in the world, right? Are we called to be workers for Jesus Christ? All right. Are we working for Jesus Christ? That's a question we need to ask ourselves, right? Beautiful thing is we have an initiative for tomorrow morning. Nice and early in the morning to do some work for who? Amen. Jesus Christ. Anybody want to do that for Jesus Christ? Is it too much of a sacrifice to go to sleep early tonight and get up in the morning? We'll see tomorrow, won't we? Hmm. How many people here are serious for Jesus Christ? Who's able, who's able-bodied and able to actually do that tomorrow? We cannot be just speaking the word. We must become God's word. Amen. Living epistles known and read of all men. And believe me, by your fruits you shall be known. Just like me, by my fruits I shall be known too, right? It applies to everybody, doesn't it? So these people who are in these churches have not, by rejecting light, severed their connection with God. They are connected to God. And some of them are more connected to God than some of us are. The truth is that God can, cannot find enough people that want to become laborers for Him in truth, in sincerity, and with, really with all their heart. He will eventually, you know that we're told, He will eventually have to take up the reins Himself, you know that, to finish the work. Because the ones He, have, he has called they want to continue to be comfortable. He will eventually take up the reins in his own hands so that this work can finally get wrapped up. That's right. You know that after choosing the 12 disciples, did you know that Jesus actually chose, chose another 70? Right after, right after he chose the 12, Jesus chose 70 unnamed others into the field in his day. And you know, these are unnamed individuals, but do you know that they had victory over demons that the disciples didn't even have? They said they came back and said, you know, Jesus, even the demons are, are subject to us. Then the disciples come back and say, why can't we do this? Remember that? You remember that, right? The named disciples, the ones that are famous throughout the whole world, couldn't get some demons out in the, in the beginning. But these 70 who he who were unnamed, he sent them out, they were able to do things that even the disciples couldn't do until later on. Sometimes it's the unknown people, unnamed, 
obscure are more connected to God than those that are claiming to be even walking with Him. But so Jesus, after choosing the twelve, chooses seventy unnamed others into the field in His day. But notice what He states that they were to pray for. He told them, you have to pray for something. Notice in Luke chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Luke chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. This is after he had already chosen the 12. And this is how it starts. After these things, what things? When he chose the 12. After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also. And sent them two and two before his day. What well, a matter of fact, isn't that what we're going to pray do tomorrow? Two and two, right? Usually you go two and two, right? Normally that's the way we do things, right? God says when you go to a door, you should go two and two, right? When you go to give something to somebody, you should go with two of you, right? Because just in case one lacks, the other one can balance out the other one, right? It's a beautiful way, it's a balancing act, isn't it? But this is what God does. Notice he sent the 70, he sent them two and two before his face into every city. How many cities? every city and place where he himself was going to go. These were trailblazers. These 70 unnamed individuals were trailblazers. And believe me, they were blazing hot. They were blazing hot. That's why God can trust them to go and blaze the trail. Anybody here want to be a trailblazer? I know I do. But in fact, it's the trailblazers that are going to give the, the loud cry. Is it the ten virgins that give the loud cry? Aren't they all sleeping? How many of them? How many of them in the parable were sleeping? All ten? Do they represent all the churches of the world? Don't they? In a certain context, they do. You know that. But there was another group. There were some unnamed. They weren't called virgins, were they? They were unnamed, an unnamed other group of individuals, just like the 70, who were inconspicuous, comes out of the blue, out of nowhere, and then what are they doing? They're blazing the trail. They're on fire for God. They don't need a name. You know why they only have one name? They all have the same name. The Lord of Righteousness. And they will also go to every city and every place where the Lord is coming. But notice what he says to them. Therefore, God, Jesus says to them, the 70, he says, the harvest truly is great. But sadly, the laborers are few. And he tells them to pray for something very specific. Do we pray specifically? Yes, we should be praying specifically, right? Pray specifically, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Imagine, Jesus was asking these inconspicuous trailblazers to pray for something that we need to pray for even today. The call was already given even this morning just to start to get very active, get back, in, back on track. With activity. That same prayer is actually more pertinent today than it was back then. God has many people in various churches all across the globe and he wants them to be brought into his most spectacular shining light. Amen? I didn't get no amens on that one. Man, that's sad. Are you on the way? Are you sleeping? Anybody here sleeping? I hope not. Because that would be detrimental to the person. He calls the fallen systems of religion Babylon. But you know that we can also be Babylonians? Yeah. How many of those virgins were Babylonians? Half. Wasn't it? Well, they were, they were Babylonians, weren't they? Babylonians, they were in confusion. They were sleeping. They were, they, were, they, were, they were careless. They didn't care nothing about anything but themselves. They wanted to be comfortable. Remember what happened to the Israelites because they got too comfortable. 
God had to, actually he couldn't prevent the afflictions to come upon them. You know that? It's not that God brings affliction, you know that? God did not bring the afflictions of the Egyptians upon the Israelites. God could not prevent the afflictions from the, Israel, from, the Egypt, from the Egyptians upon the Israelites because the Israelites had forgotten him. They forgot that their blessings were coming from the Lord. Their protection was coming from the Lord, not from the Egyptians. Matter of fact, when they started trusting into Egypt, they said, man, this is a great country. We're doing great here. That very same country became their affliction. Whatever we put our trust in will eventually destroy us if it isn't God. He calls the fallen systems of religion Babylon, meaning churches that are confused regarding his true nature and ways. But remember, he has many of his children in these churches. In the 18th chapter of Revelation, we're going to look at Revelation 18, verse 4, the people of God are called upon to come out of Babylon. The people of who? The people of God are called upon to come out of Babylon. Notice here Revelation 18, 4, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. Who's people? God's people. Come out of her. That ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Israel began to partake of the very sins of Egypt, and so was receiving afflictions. And God is saying, God is calling his people today to come out of Babylon. When the loud cry is heard, they will exit these fallen churches and bind themselves to the sparking light of Christ. Notice this quotation from the Great Controversy, page 390. It says, <clears throat> Notwithstanding the spiritual darkness and alienation from God that exists in the churches which constitute Babylon, the great body of Christ's true followers are still to be found in their communion. So according to this quotation and this commentary, most of God's children, you know, I did some research before doing this presentation. And because God calls his people Protestants. Isn't that right? Those are, those are the ones that are supposed to be God's people, right? The Protestants. Because we protest against having a, 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 a king or a pope. Right? And we protest against that. Right? When the people left Europe back in the days when they were coming to this country to form the United States of America, they were fleeing a system, a political and religious system. They didn't want to have a king over them with absolute, you know, totalitarian power, or a pope over them, which usurps the authority of God. They wanted to go to a new land where it was organized by the people and for the people. It was only worshiping God in heaven and having him to be the head of the church. Amen? Amen. And so, I did some research and when you look at how many people in the world are Protestants today versus how many are still under the system of popery? Do you know that Protestants are in the minority today? Back in the days when these quotations were written, which was a couple of hundred years ago, a hundred and something years ago actually, something like that, 
Protestantism was the majority. It was. But today, it's actually the minority. And in America, it's also a minority. So according to this quotation, most of God's children are still in these Babylonian systems and churches. And this means that we need to know how to cry aloud. Do you agree with that? We need to learn how to cry aloud. When does deliverance come? When do they come to the children of Israel? When they sighed and cried aloud. We need to be able to catch the attention of many people because we're supposed to be the voice of God to the nations. But you know what? We are outnumbered. And God wants the nations to hear Him through you and through me. You know that we cannot just whisper God's messages to them, if you understand what I mean. We need to cry and cry aloud. And we're going to see what that means in just a little while. But first, we need to know that there is a particular time when the loud cry will be given. So let's go back to Revelation 18, verses 1 and 2 again. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the way is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Notice that there are two stages revealed in these two verses. Did you catch it? Did anybody catch it? There's two stages. Have you, didn't you catch it? If you didn't catch it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain it to you in a minute here. The first stage, or movement, is found in verse 1. What does verse 1 say? I saw an angel come down having great power, and the earth was what? Lightened with his glory. This is going on right now, isn't it? Right. All of us should be part of this stage or movement right now. We are the ones symbolized by the angel slash messenger, which is said to have come down from heaven. But how? How do we come down from heaven when we're on earth? This means that we have been sent out from the most holy apartment of the heavenly sanctuary. We should have followed Christ into the holy of holies when he went in. Is that right? Yes? Yes. Yes. In 1844, where did Christ go? From the holy to the most holy. And God's people, by faith, would have followed him in to the most holy. You understand me, right? It means that we would have been reaching a level of maturity and oneness with Christ so that we can be fitted up to do some special work. We are those people symbolized by the angel which is said to have come down from heaven, meaning that we have been sent out from the most holy apartment of the heavenly sanctuary, equipped to do the final work of illuminating this world regarding God's true nature and character. Is that you? Is that me? Because we have gone, we have come too far. Do you, do you realize that? We have been given too many privileges to not be that angel flying in the midst of heaven right now. We are to be seeking this earth and praying for God to place us in contact with souls that have opened doors for us to come in and sup with them. We cannot afford to be sleeping in a comfort zone. A com comfort zones, those are deadly. You realize that? Comfort zones are deadly. They should be called danger zones. But Satan is slick. He takes the word danger and he puts comfort. 
We cannot afford to be sleeping in our comfort zones, for many will never come out of that zone, unfortunately. The longer that we remain in that zone, while being exposed to God's spectacular blazing light, the more dangerous it becomes. Verse 2 of Revelation 18 takes us into the future. Did you know that? Verse 2 of Revelation 18 takes us into the near future to some extent. Although we know that Babylon represents confusion and spiritual darkness and alienation from God, it is not completely fallen as of yet. Let me explain. Notice Revelation 14, verses 6 and 8. Or 6 through 8. It says, we're just going to read this part. It says, She made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And I underlined and emboldened that word, made. She, Babylon, made all nations. How many nations? All nations. She made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Is this present or is this future for us? It's future. Notice, these verses reveal something very interesting. There will come a time in the very near future when the system that is called Babylon, which again represents all the various churches that do not have the true light of Christ in them, will be able to, quote-unquote, make all nations drink of the wrath of her fornication. What does this mean? It means that this spurious system of religion will get to a place where she will be granted authority to make all nations through a worldwide control mechanism, drink her wine or follow her doctrines and receive the same consequences that she will receive, the wrath of her fornications, which is due to rejecting the true light of Jesus Christ. You with me? You got that? So you may ask, how in the world will this be done? How can this be possible in a free world? Testimonies from the Church, volume 8, page 94, says this is going to be done by forcing men to accept a spurious Sabbath. And this can be very clearly understood as one does an in-depth study in uh, uh, regard to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation 13 also reveals this very thing. Notice here, this is the great controversy 389 and 390 says, Not yet, however, can it be said that she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. She has not yet made all nations do this. Not until this condition shall be reached and the union of the church with the world shall be fully accomplished throughout Christendom will the fall of Babylon be complete. The change is a progressive one, and the perfect fulfillment of Revelation 14.8 is yet future. And you know, when, when this actually happens, which is coming soon, when this actually happens, it can then be said, or the words of Revelation 18.5 could then be said, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. So when do the sins reach unto heaven? When the law of God is finally made void by legislation. For 179 years now, God has given the message of Revelation 14 its place in the line of prophecy and the work. And this work of the Revelation 14, the three angels' messages that we see there, that work will not cease to the end of this earth's history. It will continue to be present truth. But 
Revelation 18 points to the time when as the result of rejecting, and this is Great Controversy 390, rejecting the threefold for warning of Revelation 14, 6 to 12, the church will have reached the condition foretold by the second angel, and the people of God still in Babylon will be called upon to separate from her communion. And this message, we're told, is the last that will ever be given to the world. So what does the loud cry include then? We already looked at what it didn't include, right? It doesn't include a sweeping denunciation of peoples in any particular denomination. But what does it include? It includes an, un an, an unmasking of what constitutes Babylon. Isn't that what we see in Revelation 14, verses 6 to 12? We also see that in Revelation 18, verses 1 to 4. It includes an unmasking of what constitutes Babylon. The people need to know the truth so that their hearts become stirred up. That's part of it. That's part of the loud cry. Notice here in the Great Controversy 603, 604, and 606, it says, the sins of Babylon will be laid open. And I underline these things here, these next few things. It says, the fearful results of enforcing the observances of the church by civil authority, that's, number one, that's one thing, right? That needs to be revealed. Listen to this again. What is it that we need to reveal? The fearful results of enforcing the observances of the church by civil authority, even if it was Sabbath, even if it was the correct day that was being enforced, that still would be Babylonian. Are you with me? Yes. You cannot force people to worship. God never said, if you don't worship me, I'm going to do this to you. He says, if you love me, Keep my commandments. He invites us. He knocks at the door. He says, let me come in. He doesn't break it down. So, one of the things that needs to be revealed to his people, if you want to understand what is contained within the loud cry, one of the things contained within the loud cry is to teach people the fearful results of enforcing the observances of the church by civil authority. Another thing that needs to be revealed, the inroads of spiritualism. You have to let people know that the, that the dead know nothing. They're not floating around talking to you and telling you this is the way because I've come back from the dead to tell you God has sent me. What happened to King Saul when he wanted to try to investigate the dead. The devil came disguised as who? Samuel. Even though he told him the truth. <laughs> right? But still, Satan uses truth too. You know? He mingles truth with error to get people to believe whatever he says. But we need to reveal these things to people. We need to let them know the dangers and the inroads of spiritualism. That's part of it. And here's another one. The stealthy but rapid progress of the people power. You have to let them know this is not God's way. And show them why. All of this will be unmasked in the Lord Christ movement. And by these solemn warnings, the people will be stirred. Thousands upon thousands will listen who have never heard words like these. Amen? Amen. Amen. But what else does it include? What else does the loud cry include? It also includes the unmasking of somebody else. And I'm going to ask that if you can guess who that is. Anybody? Well, Satan is, 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 is unmasking these systems. But there's somebody else that needs to be unmasked. Antichrist, well that's part of all this already, right? Because this, this system is Antichrist. It also includes the unmasking of Christ and his ways. Because most people are seeing Christ through a veil. And the veil is to be removed from the eyes of humanity. Amen? 
That's what we're doing now, by the way. That's what we should be doing now. Yes? So that they can then also receive these warnings as well. That's the, that's the preliminary work, actually. Right? But even then, it'll be even unmasked. Even, it will still go on, you know. These works will continue concurrently to the coming of Christ. Or till the closure of probation, actually. Notice here in Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 372, several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. And I have answered, it is the third angel's message in verity. In other words, in truth. Amen? Amen. Isn't this part of what needs to be revealed? Absolutely. These messages were actually given to us 135 years ago. But today they need to go forth with Holy Ghost power. Amen? Amen. Notice here. Testimonies of ministers and gospel workers, 91 and 92. The Lord in His great mercy sent a most precious message to His people through elders E.J. Wagner and A.T. Jones back in, in the day. This message was to bring more prominently before the world. Remember, we were told that if these messages were accepted back then, Christ would have ere long come to claim His people. So is this part of the loud cry messages? Absolutely. This message to, was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith in the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. How is it that the righteousness of Christ is made manifest in you? When people see your obedience to God. Amen? Amen. Amen? By their fruits, you shall know them. And by our fruits, we shall be known. Many have lost and have lost sight of Jesus Christ. They need to have their eyes directed to His divine person, His merits, and His changeless love for the human family. Why is it that they need to be directed to these thoughts and these understandings of truth? This is the bright light that the world needs. Because they think that the love of God is subjective, or it, it, you know, it's, it's, it, it can vary. Right? He, can, he can love you today, tomorrow he can hate you. Isn't that what most people think? Yeah. But we need to be able to share and teach and show the world that the love of God is changeless. For the human family. Notice it didn't say the Christian family. What did it say? The human family. All power is given into his hands. That he may dispense rich gifts unto men. Imparting the priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of His Spirit in a large measure. This doesn't mean you're going to be on a mountaintop with a megaphone and screaming on the top of your lungs. That's not what it means to give the loud cry. And we're going to see that in a minute. So why is this, or why is the final movement called then the loud cry? If it's not standing on top of a mountain with a megaphone, screaming at the top of our lungs. Why is it called the loud cry? This is where we need to really get and pay attention. Let's think about this for a minute. What comes to your mind when you think or hear the term loud cry. Think about that. Can you imagine someone maybe wailing for a loved one or a lost loved one when someone dies? Have you seen people giving loud cries when someone has died? Have you ever been to a funeral and somebody just crying loudly because they, they're going to miss someone? You ever, you ever seen that? I've seen that many times. I mean loudly. A loud cry. That's a type of loud cry, isn't it? That is not necessarily the type of cry 
that the loud cry, uh, what it means when, when it says that we should be given a loud cry. But notice here, I can imagine someone crying loudly at the top of their lungs for somebody who they have just lost. But what about this? Can you imagine someone crying loudly for someone that is in danger? Somebody is about to get hit by a car. You're going to hear somebody crying loud for them to hear you so they can get out and be saved. Yes or no? Well, guess what? In a sense, that is it. The loud cry is not only the last messages to be given to the world, but it denotes how those messages are given. They are to be given by the people that have the mind of God. They will be calling people out of Babylon in such a way that it expresses deep emotional ties with the ones being called out, or in other sense, the human race. They will be seen to be extremely concerned for those in the fallen systems of churches. It will be seen that the love that they have for souls is unparalleled by any that this world can produce. It will be as if God were crying loudly for these souls through them. Amen? Amen. Amen. That is what it's called a loud cry. The loud cry. In Testimonies for the Church, 619, the message of Christ's righteousness is to sound from one end of the earth to the other to prepare the way of the Lord. Another context of loud cry. This is the glory of God, which closes the work of the third angel. It is this type of loud cry, brethren, that we need to pray to be able to manifest or to allow God to manifest through us. It is the love of God shining through sinful fallen flesh that the world needs right now. The last, this is Christ's object lesson, page 415. These are very familiar verses or quotations. The last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. The children of God are to manifest his glory, his character. In their own life and character, they are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. God wants to show the world a saint that used to be a sinner. Amen? He wants to change the sinner into the saint so that they can see that his love is powerful. Amen. Yeah. It is the latter rain that will prepare us and prepare our hearts, brethren. Amen? Amen. So as we contemplate these thoughts of what the loud cry really entails and what God wants to do in and through each and every one of us. Let us pray for this as never before. What did Jesus say to the 70 to pray for? Pray for the Lord of harvest to send workers. Amen? Amen. And it starts with you and it starts with me. By our fruits we will be known. Are we willing to get out of our comfort zones or slash danger zones? Because to be a laborer in the field, to be a loud cry messenger means to be a trailblazer. It means to give up everything for Jesus Christ. Go wherever he says go, do whatever he says do, say whatever he tells us to say, without fear, without any thought 
of preserving our lives. That's what it takes to be a loud cry messenger. Amen? Amen. I want to be one of those. Amen. If you want to be one of those, I invite you to take a stand right now. Because we're going to pray. But I want you to let the Lord know that you want to be one of those loud cry messengers. If you want to be one of those, take a stand. Let us stand for Jesus Christ. Let us give all for Jesus Christ. Let us not marinate in our comfort zones because they're dangerous. It's a dangerous place to be. Let us surrender everything. Let us make a commitment to sacrifice our entire beings. All of our time belongs to God. You see, we think God only, because God only demands a tenth or a seventh of our week that the rest we can do whatever we want because it belongs to us. But you know what? Everything belongs to God. All our time belongs to God. All our money belongs to God. All of us, who we are, everything we have belongs to God. Are we willing to give it to Him? He has given all for you and for me. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for giving us all. We thank you for teaching us today what the loud cry really means and what it's all about and what it does not contain. We see that you have called us to be trailblazers, not to be sleeping virgins, so that we can actually give the loud cry and make a way for you to come as King of kings and Lord of lords. Help us, Lord. Have mercy on us. Cleanse us, Lord, of every earthliness within us. Help us, Lord, to give up all as we contemplate the thought that you gave up all for us. Help us to not hold on to anything any longer. Liberate us. Give us power. And so, dear Father, we thank you for speaking to us. We thank you for taking charge of this time that we just spent listening to your words. May they be cemented in our hearts. And may we be cemented in your kingdom. Dear Father, we thank you and we praise you and we love you. And we ask that you Honor this prayer according to your will, for we ask it according to your will. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. We pray that his blood will moisten this prayer, that it may reach your throne, and that, Lord, it will be so. For we thank you, and we ask this for your honor and your glory. Amen. 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 And let the words of our mouth Amen. and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our being. Amen. 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 Amen.